something I've been working on for a while. It's, um, I think there's a poem or two in here somewhere, but it's kind of the Michelangelo theory of looking at a big block of marble and going, well, there's David. <laughs> I just got No. We'll see how we go. It's called culture jacking. Culture jack. It's a good word, isn't it? Good phrase. It's mine. Culture. <laughs> Trademark. <laughs> We are the lounge music, we are the lava lamps, we are the dashboard dogs, we are the flares, the flads, the fluffy dice, we are irony! <laughs> Generation X, Y, Z, with our retro kitsch, pomo cred slogan to our sleeves, we are the culture jackers. <laughs> Adapters and adopters of global exotica, primitive scarifications, Maasai ear hoops, Asian calligraphy, sure! Even as we speak, Chinese kids are getting Aussie tattoos. <laughs> this one read, get dog up, you mate. <laughs> this one say flat out like lizard drinking. <laughs> Has very deep spiritual significance. <laughs> we culture jack, we class jack, fancy dress like the working class. Lifestyle consultants go to gyms to build the muscle of farm labourers. Muscle not as byproduct of honest toil, but as prosthetic decoration. Body as product, body as package, body as mantle of indentured flesh. Body to be shown off in nightclubs called the factory, bars called the foundry, pubs called the forge. The working class past is being boutique. The old fish shop is a cafe. The old butcher shop sells antiques. We seem lonesome for industrial grit, nostalgic to get our hands dirty. Our primitive id has a thirst for things. Our virtual imagineerings won't slake. A lizard reflex to kill food, to make stuff with our hands. <laughs> Flip the coin, what might you find? Klondike miners with iPods. Victorian washerwomen sending tweets. Child chimney sweeps playing Nintendos while they die of <laughs> TB. We've given birth to history and now suffer the pangs. Post-natal has become post-industrial depression. So we sublimate, fetishize, theme park the past. Reduce labour to a peacock strut, tragedy to kitsch. Chairman Mao's a Mickey Mouse watch, the Titanic a theme park ride. 9-11 should be a video game. It probably is. <laughs> Go on, give Stalin a cooking show. Make Auschwitz a five-star fat farm with bulimic supermodel Nazi guards and camp commandant Heston Blumenthal souffles in the oven now! <laughs> this kind of rant, I admit it's a luxury. The people seriously in need wouldn't know or care what the fuck I was on about, too busy dodging bombs or looking for bread. Still, it's a tragedy, this tragedy of privilege, <laughs> being comfortably middle class without a cause as we try and spread our guilt like margarine through the plasma valleys of our mediated mediocrity, get best bang for our bleeding heart buck, because social conscience is just more market share. Consult your guilt broker, build your angst portfolio of compassion and sympathy and empathy and concern and darling. The lip service in this place is central. <laughs> Go on, buy ethical coffee and eggs. <laughs> there are worse crimes. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I offer no alternatives. I'm just a dog barking at waves. I'm just going through a garbage dump with a pair of chopsticks. I once had a heckler, this punk, Jerry. He heckled me in Canberra, lots of times in Sydney. He'd just pop up like an angry jack-in-the-box to heckle me at poetry gigs. I think he followed me around. Like some kind of heckler groupie. I was flattered. <laughs> During one of these rants, he once sprang up and shouted, Yeah? Well, what are you going to do about it? 
I was stumped. It was the best question, the only question, what are you going to do about it? I didn't know then, I don't know now. Solutions. Every business now offers them hair solutions, plumbing solutions, shower solutions, final <laughs> solutions. <laughs> Poetic solutions? It's going to be a short-lived business. <laughs> now I'm, I'm a primary producer. I raise questions. Like how are you going to change the world if you can't change your underpants? So why not? Why not consume tragedy like fast food? Why not convenience, horror, grief, a spectator sport? Why not express, check out guilt, six items or less? Why not take a magic misery tour through the third world? Just click to add the cart. Why not mistake the History Channel for a serious education? Tune into my back big fat spiritual makeover. Seek to salve your soul through that day's bit of death calendar wisdom or a statue of Buddha at your bogan backyard barbecue because it's spiritual, man! Like you. Maybe a statue of Shiva or some Greek god, but not Jesus. That would just be creepy. <laughs> Have a big crucified Christ hanging up there while you try and cook snags. It's like, we're well, out of tomato sauce, man. No worries, there's some coming from Jesus' hands. <laughs> no way, man, look, there's barbecue sauce coming from his feet. Mustard from his side. Holy shit, it's a miracle. That's right. Buy a new three-in-one Jesus barbecue make today. Get bonus rotisserie crucifix absolutely free. We are irony. Is it just irony? This collision of frippery and horror or symptomatic of a deeper need to connect with something real beneath the perspex, the bubble wrap, the condom of irony. Fucking irony. The stuff's lantana, a weed, a malaise on our white-headed souls. Rotten my soul in the bosom of Abraham, rotten my soul. Come on. Sorry. Christ, I bang on about it. <laughs> and so what is it? Well, I've thought about it quite a bit, and I think what it boils down to is one little word. I just hate fake. That great lake of fake spewed in my face like a spumante spitball of insult and degradation. And yet, I'm terrified of sincerity. <laughs> so no, I'm not casting stones, because you know what they say about people who live in glass houses. Yeah. They're exhibitionists. <laughs> who attract perverts. And get sunburnt. <laughs> Think global, act local. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the T-shirt. <laughs> Look, some of you might be the real deal. Some of you might break teeth at the frack face, visit frightened little brown people in jail, fight to save the great barrier grief, put corks in the asses of cows. I don't know, but actually do stuff. Most of us, <laughs> nah. we're happy to shelter in the shade of this volcano of moronicness. Occasionally, politely shake a wrist like a limp lettuce leaf. Oh, stop it. Stop all your wickedness. Go away. But that's, that's okay. That's the way it's always been, just like there's always been Cassandras and Jeremiah's like me to feed on the doom. And thank you, by the way, for your apathy. It generates works for the likes of me, the self-unemployed. Which brings us neatly to the last item in the box. If you're sick of irony, try new paradox. Like you've got to love your enemies. But not for Christian reasons, oh, no, no, no. For selfish reasons. Your enemies define you. They give you a sense of purpose and identity, a black backdrop against which to shine. Without your enemies, you might scrape back the dock to find that you were all barnacle and no 
rock. Without your enemies, you got no story. No big bad wolf, no little red, no daft, no Luke, no Joker, no Batman. You get in the full magnitude of this. We need the big bad boogeyman. Christ, how do we get here? <laughs> Nothing to be done. I can't go on like this. That's what you think. Meaninglessness, ness, ness, ness. Yes, it's nothing new. Samuel Beckett knew. We are the army. But still, what you gotta, what you gotta, what you gotta, what you gotta do about it? I don't fucking know, Jerry. It's not my job to find answers. This is the gripe queue. You want solutions? Take a ticket and wait. Forgot her. <laughs> but that's a bit of a bummer to end on. So. This love song dedication goes out to that special little guy who made me all I am. My beautiful, darling, cherished enemy. Did you ever know that you're my hero? You're everything I wished I could be. And I could fly higher than an eagle. Cause you are the oil slick on my sea. Cut, 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 cut. Thank you.